Hello everybody and welcome to the endocrine system. This first video is going to be about hormones, the different types of hormones and some example pathways, as well as the different ways that we can secrete hormones. So we'll start with what is the fundamental question of the video. What are hormones? The hormones are your body's chemical messaging system. If this video were to be about the nervous system instead of the endocrine system, then what we would be discussing in that case are voltage-based signals. But here in the endocrine system, we're going to be counting on molecules, binding to appropriate receptors, and eventually causing some physiological changes. And as we'll come to see, there are many ways in which we can achieve this goal as some hormones seek to take a more indirect approach to passing along a signal and some seek to do it themselves with a more direct approach. Approach. Now with that said, there are definitely a few different ways that we can go ahead and secrete hormones and we'll go ahead and discuss some of these now paired with visual examples. The first being endocrine hormones which are released directly into the bloodstream. And we can see that in our visual example over here we have our cell that is generating hormones, passing them along to the bloodstream. The hormones will make their way out of the bloodstream, eventually landing at receptors at the target cell. Next would be paracrine hormones, which are hormones that are secreted by one cell, and the target are neighboring cells. And we can see that in the middle example, we have the originator cell here generating some hormones. And here the geographic location is a little bit more prominent because this cell is a direct neighbor to the originator cell. These hormones will come on down and directly interact with the receptors of the target cell. Now last but not least we have what is maybe the most interesting mode of hormone secretion and that is known as autocrine hormone secretion. Let's take it over to the visual. When we're talking about autocrine hormone secretion, we're talking about one cell that is generating hormones that will then come back and affect the very same cell binding to receptors on the cell. And this makes the cells that generate these autocrine hormones very cool because they're first of all capable of synthesizing these amazing chemical messengers, but they also house the corresponding receptors, meaning that they can directly benefit from the release of their own hormones. There are also a few main types of hormones that we're gonna go ahead and dive into. And don't worry about jotting this down just yet. We're gonna dive into each of these in a little bit more depth as we move forward. I just wanna set a baseline here to start. The first one is known as peptide hormones. We also have steroid hormones and amino acid derived hormones. Now, when you think of peptide hormones, think proteins. P for peptide, P for proteins. These are protein-based hormones, meaning that they are made of polypeptides. Now, appropriately enough, the synthesis of these protein-based hormones occurs in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we can note right here. It sits just outside of the nucleus of a cell. Now, why is the rough ER the appropriate place to be generating these hormones? Well, if you don't recall, the rough ER is riddled with ribosomes, small structures responsible for aiding protein synthesis. And the rough ER as a whole is responsible for aiding protein synthesis. So we now know what peptide hormones are, but how do they do what they do? How do they go about passing along these signals? Well, remember, peptide hormones are proteins, meaning that they're generally gonna be large and pretty polar. What this also means is that because of their polarity, they're gonna be water soluble, which means they can freely flow through the blood. But because of that same polarity, they are going to be lipophobic. They are not lipid soluble, which means that these hormones cannot directly pass through a cellular membrane. So instead, they're gonna to have to take a different course of action. They're gonna bind receptors on the cell surface so they don't ever have to cross over into the intracellular domain on their own. And so we have a great visual example over here on the right. Here's our mock peptide hormone in orange. It's in the extracellular environment. And instead of crossing directly through the cell membrane, which it's not capable of due to its polarity, it is instead going to associate and bind to a receptor on the extracellular domain. This is a process known as indirect stimulation where a signal is still being propagated in the intracellular environment, but it's not the original hormone that's gonna be doing it throughout the whole process. Instead, that peptide hormone is gonna interact with a receptor on the cell's surface and kick off on the inside of the cell something known as a signal transduction pathway. And in just a moment, we are actually gonna be able to see a couple of examples of different modes for how this indirect stimulation takes place. But before we go ahead and do that, I wanna set a little bit of a baseline by nailing down some key terms that we should know, as well as giving a very generalized overview of the modes that we'll see in more depth later on. The first thing that we need a rock solid understanding of is the ligand gated receptor. These are those big receptors that we were talking about a little bit before that are responsible for grabbing onto that peptide hormone on the outside of the cell 
and making some signal transduction magic happen on the inside of the cell. Now once the beginning of this process occurs, we've taken that peptide hormone and we're causing some kind of effect on the inside of the cell. Well, what happens next? We need more messengers if we can't rely on the hormone in the intracellular environment. And that is where the secondary messengers come into play. These secondary messengers are signaling molecules that are available in the inside of the cell, but they are not the original hormone. And so now we're going to go ahead and cover some very important examples that are going to come up in later slides when we start to dig into those different modes of ligand-gated reception and signal transduction pathways. We'll go ahead and start with CAMP, cyclic AMP. We also have IP3, which is short for inositol triphosphate, DAG DAG, which is short for diacyl glycerol, and CA2+, which is very simply calcium 2 plus ions. And as promised, here are those two types of ligand-gated receptors that we're going to cover in a little more depth as we move on. The first is known as a GPCR, which stands for G-coupled protein receptor. The other form of ligand-gated receptor that we're going to cover is known as a receptor tyrosine kinase, or RTK. Now while we're here, I also want to give a quick shout out to ligand-gated ion channels. Ligand-gated ion channels are liable to appear in ligand-gated receptor scenarios. What happens is we have this interaction with the ligand-gated receptor and our hormone on the outside of the cell. We have all of this secondary messaging happening inside of the cell. And sometimes those secondary messengers will act as ligands themselves. Recall, ligand-gated ion channels are protein channels that exist in a membrane which allow for the passage of ions that are too polar to pass through membranes themselves. Ligand-gated ion channels in particular respond to a physical mechanical alteration when they bind a ligand. And so we are more than capable of achieving this result with a secondary messenger. Now here we have our first example of a peptide hormone and a signal transduction pathway. And before you start worrying and rushing and trying to get everything on this page down all at once, don't worry about it. We're going to go through each step a couple at a time, and they're going to be paired with some visual examples so we can really get into this and break it down. Feel free to come back to this slide at a later point in the video or in your own independent study time for review. All right, so let's go ahead and kick off the IP3 DAG pathway discussion. And I'd like to preface by saying the reason it's called IP3 DAG pathway is that IP3 and DAG DAG are two secondary messengers that are eventually going to be created in this pathway. And we'll get there. Don't worry about that just yet. And as always, I really like to keep the broader perspective in mind as we move through something as microscopic as this pathway. So as we're moving through each step, remember that this pathway at its core is about releasing calcium 2 plus from the endoplasmic reticulum. So step one, keeping in the spirit of peptide hormones, this whole thing is going to kick off when a ligand, in this case a peptide hormone, binds to our GPCR. And we can see that here. This is an expanded version of a visual that we've already seen. Here is our extracellular signal molecule, that peptide hormone, and it's going to associate with this G protein coupled receptor, remaining at all times in the extracellular environment. Remember, peptide hormones never cross directly through the cellular membrane into the intracellular environment. From there, the GPCR is going to go ahead and activate that G protein that is connected with in the intracellular environment. And in this case, this is going to occur by binding one molecule of GTP, a molecule that is very similar to the high energy molecule ATP. And so we can see that as well. We've had our signal molecule bind on the outside of the cell. On the inside, this translates to the activation of a G protein. So where do we go from here? As we said, G proteins will go on and do a whole bunch of important stuff for us inside the cell. In this case, for the IP3 DAG pathway, the G protein is going to go ahead and activate an enzyme for us, and that enzyme's name is phospholipase C, which can be found right in the center of our visual. Now, even just looking at the name of this enzyme, we can start to infer what its role might be, with the prefix being phospholipase, referring to phospholipids, and the suffix ace referring to enzymes. In this case, phospholipase C is going to be something that cleaves lipids. We're going to go ahead and break down those ester bonds within lipids. Now for the purposes of this pathway, phospholipase C is going to go ahead and target a specific lipid in the membrane known as PIP2, which we can go ahead and see right over here. And the cleavage of PIP2 is going to generate two separate secondary messengers, a couple that you've heard of already, IP3 and DAG. And here we can see our lovely DAG and IP3. 
Now here is where we kind of leave DAG to the side because it's going to go on to be very productive in other pathways. IP3 is going to carry on towards our calcium release goal. The secondary messenger IP3 is going to go over to the endoplasmic reticulum and directly bind a ligand-gated calcium 2 plus channel on its surface. The ligand, of course, being in this case IP3. And so you can kind of imagine the creation of IP3 would be up here. It's going to go all the way down to the endoplasmic reticulum and bind to that channel. Once the ligand-gated channel is bound with IP3, it is going to open up and allow all of this calcium to flow out. And where is this calcium going to go? It's going to end up in the cytosol of the cell. Now what happens next is a perfect example of why signal transduction pathways are so efficient. Remember, we just started with one interaction between a peptide hormone on the outside of a cell and a receptor. Yet now somehow we have all of these free calcium ions that are going to go on to affect a bunch of different proteins that are going to go on to affect a bunch of different cellular responses. And we can really appreciate that when we take a look at the bigger picture. We're just starting with one little interaction over here and our signal molecule doesn't even enter the cell which is the most amazing part. With this pathway we are able to turn one interaction on the outside of the cell into an activated protein inside, an activated enzyme, the creation of two secondary messengers, and the release of all of these ions that are going to go on to affect a whole bunch of different pathways. All right, so now that we've really broken down the mechanism of a GPCR pathway, in particular the IP3DAG DAG pathway, let's go ahead and talk about the other mode of signal transduction which is possible, the mode that uses receptor tyrosine kinases as their ligand-gated receptor. Receptor tyrosine kinases, or RTKs, are interesting because they're composed of two identical components that dimerize. Once they are bound by the appropriate ligand and activated, and you can kind of think of this very simply as two siblings holding hands, which is to say that the dimerization of the two components very simply means that they are going to come together and interact. Now when they do this, another thing that makes them very cool is they're going to cross phosphorylate. Phosphorylation of course being the addition of a high energy phosphate group to something, with cross phosphorylation meaning that one component is going to phosphorylate the other and vice versa. And so we can take a peek over at our visual example and we're starting with inactivated RTKs, separated, not bound, and once we do bind our signaling molecule, they're going to dimerize and interact, and from there they'll go ahead and cross-phosphorylate. These phosphate groups are then able to interact with other proteins and this cross-phosphorylation gives rise to another secondary messenger response. We have reached the second type of hormone that we're going to discuss for this video, the steroid hormone. Steroid hormones are actually generated from modified cholesterol molecules. And if you look down to the visual, it's not hard to see the resemblance. So here is our initial cholesterol. And over here we have, for example, steroid hormones, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and aldosterone. The key identifying structure is the fused four ring structure. If we were to look over to cholesterol, we can see one ring, two rings, three rings and four rings, with the fourth and final ring having a pentose shape rather than a hexagonal shape. And we can see that the same is true for our example steroid hormones. Let's look at testosterone. One, two, three, four rings. Progesterone is the same, estrogen and aldosterone. Now in terms of synthesis, steroid hormones are going to be generated in the smooth ER, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and steroid production in the smooth ER is just as appropriate as peptide hormone production in the rough ER because the smooth ER is responsible for aiding lipid production which is what we're working with with steroids because cholesterol if you recall is a lipid and of course we don't need to be working with the rough ER because we are not making steroids out of proteins so who is making these steroid hormones who's going to be using their smooth endoplasmic reticulums to make these lipid based hormones well steroid hormones comprise all of the hormones that are released by the adrenal cortex and the gonads of humans the gonads of course being the testes and the ovaries for the adrenal cortex the cortex being this outer portion of the adrenal gland, a gland that we're going to touch on in a later video. The important steroid hormones that it's going to go ahead and produce are glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and androgenic steroids. For the reproductive organs, for the testes and ovaries, we're going to be producing progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. Now it's over to the fun part. How do steroid hormones do what they do? Well, it's going to be a little bit different than peptide-based hormones. Because we're basing these hormones off of cholesterol, they are going to be lipophilic, 
not lipophobic, meaning that now with steroid hormones, we have a means of directly crossing cellular membranes. So again, we can say that these are lipid soluble hormones, but they are not water soluble. So if we were going to transport steroids through the blood, for example, we would have to associate them with a water soluble protein. What does it mean now that we can actually go ahead and cross the cellular membranes directly? It means that rather than taking an indirect approach where we require a signal transduction cascade, we can go ahead and jump right to direct stimulation, where our hormones are going to directly bind to receptors on the inside of the cell and the hormone is no longer banished to an existence on the outside of the cell. And so once the steroids and the receptors come together, they will form something known as a steroid receptor complex, which will go on to directly affect DNA transcription, a process that is considered slow and gradual. So here we have another wonderful visual example that we can go ahead and work off of. We have our steroid hormones in the extracellular environment. Because they are lipophilic, not lipophobic, because we're using cholesterols to make these hormones, we can just go right on through the cell membrane. Once we are in the intracellular environment, our hormones are going to associate with a receptor molecule, creating this steroid receptor complex. And this complex will go ahead and bind to DNA and affect its transcription. And so here we have a mock mRNA that would result from the affected transcription of DNA based on the binding of the steroid receptor complex. And now once that mRNA is translated, we have a brand new protein that was the result of the signal passed down from the steroid hormone. I apologize if you're not typically one for real world examples, but here's a quick one that might help us solidify our understanding of the comparison between steroid and peptide hormones. There's an old saying in soccer, let the ball do the work, which is to say that if you pass the ball down the field to your other teammates one at a time, rather than running it down the field yourself, you've let the ball do the work. You've avoided exhaustion, and you've avoided oftentimes physical encounters with defenders. But more importantly than anything, you've moved the ball down the field in the most efficient way possible. Peptide hormones go ahead and let the ball do the work. They will pass the signal along through different proteins, through different secondary messengers, and move the signal along in the most efficient means possible, maximizing the potential effects by using different components. In comparison, steroid hormones want to dribble the ball down the field. They prefer to be the quote-unquote flashy dribbler and do it all themselves. They want to go through the cellular membrane, into the nucleus, affect DNA itself. They want to do all the work, score the goal, and be the hero. The last type of hormone that we're going to discuss are amino acid-derived hormones, and they're actually pretty cool because they tend to have properties that are similar to both peptides and steroid hormones. Now, they're a little bit smaller than peptide hormones. Peptide hormones, remember, are made of proteins. Amino acids are the constituents of proteins. So we're not talking about full-blown polypeptides here. What we're talking about instead are hormones that are mostly derived from the amino acid tyrosine, which we can see right here. And so an example of a similar property that an amino acid derived hormone might have to say a peptide hormone is the polarity. We're not going to be able to bring an amino acid derived hormone directly through the cellular membrane because it expresses a similar polarity to that of a peptide hormone. And in terms of synthesis, we'll be producing these amino acid derived hormones in the rough ER and in the cytosol of cells. And just like the way that the steroid has exclusive rights to the gonads and the adrenal cortex, all of the hormones that are made in the adrenal medulla the other portion of the adrenal gland are amino acid derived, as well as T3 and T4 hormones. And those hormones that are created in the adrenal medulla, something that we'll discuss in a little bit more depth as we move on in this series, are epinephrine and norepinephrine, your fight or flight hormones. All right, so at this point, let's go ahead and move on to a mini quiz to see what you've learned. Which type of hormone is secreted directly to neighboring cells? Go ahead and pause the video now, take a moment, and answer this question. All right, welcome back. The correct answer in this case is paracrine hormones. Remember, paracrine hormones are the ones that are going to be released, secreted by one cell with the target being neighboring cells. Autocrine is incorrect. These are the hormones that are going to be secreted and then target the same cell that secreted them. Exocrine hormones are secreted by a mode that we didn't quite discuss in this video. They are secreted into glands for distribution, not related to what we're looking for in this question. And D, Endocrine hormones are also not correct. These are ones that are secreted directly into the bloodstream. Okay, this has been Hormones, the first video on the endocrine system. I hope you enjoyed and learned something today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But if not, happy studying.